Well, this is obviously, again, all about the kind of impact of AI on mobility. Um, Kirsty, I think you should kick it off because we haven't heard from you. Um, now, Morpheus is a sort of spin-out Oxford University company using deep learning to make autonomous cars safer. Now, if you obviously ask the general public, there is this sort of disbelief that autonomous cars are safer. Um, everyone is quite, you know, everyone in a general sense is quite skeptical of what autonomous cars really mean. How can we make them safer and how can we convince everyone else that they are? Thank you. I think that's a great question. And actually, it's so important because one of the big opportunities for autonomous cars is to make the roads a lot safer. So um, one of the stats that we didn't actually hear today, although there were loads of great ones, was that 95% of accidents are actually caused by human error. So humans are actually pretty shockingly bad at driving, although I suppose a lot of people in the room today wouldn't believe that was true. It sadly is the case. And actually that causes a problem for autonomous cars as well. So if you look at some recent stats from GM, they'd also say that actually the majority of accidents they have with their autonomous car is from human error. But that's a human error from the other drivers doing things the autonomous car doesn't expect. So I think for us, for me, I think the big opportunity is around simulation and how you can create better, more accurate simulated environments to test autonomous cars in, because that's the only way you can really be confident that they're safe. And you need to do, on average, 8 billion miles of driving to prove an autonomous car is safer than a human. That's an awful lot of driving, how right? How long does that take to complete? Like 12 years, right? Oh. So, I mean, <laughs> we're hoping to have them on the road in 12 years' time. So we really need to find a way of accelerating that, and that's why simulation is so critical. Really accurate, realistic, simulated worlds are the only way that we're going to make autonomous cars safer and also give the public confidence that they're safe. So, I mean, you know, when we all turned 17, maybe not all, but most of us, it was like, right, the first thing, what are we going to do? I'm going to try and pass my driving test, get my driving license so I'm allowed on the roads. Is there any sort of driving test that we can give these cars? You know, how can we sort of, again, like, you know, prove that they've passed all the right regulation, the right, you know, technical capabilities uh, that is sort of the same across the board. You know, it should be the same whether it's one automaker or another. I think that's one of the key questions. And actually, we're working with a couple of different consumer groups on what the driving test for autonomous cars should be. And I expect if I asked people in the room, everyone would have a slightly different view on actually what they think that a car should be able to do. You know, maybe it's reversing around a corner or it might be stopping at, you know, a sudden intersection. But I think the other thing to think about is that how that really works globally. So we know that people drive really differently around the globe. Driving in London is totally different from driving in Beijing or driving in, in Palo Alto. So actually, it's not going to be one driving test. It needs to be one driving test for all the different countries that that autonomous car is going to be tested in. Thank you very much. Sorry. As you may have noticed, we have a new guest on the stage. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Unfortunately, there was some issue with, the, with an AI machine not playing. Or, I don't know. There was an issue. But we My have got... Avatar. It's not me. Your avatar. OK. Oh, not again. Damn those avatars. <laughs> but Michael is uh, from... Uh, well, he's a managing partner at SoftBank. Uh, who obviously a big, big sponsor of this, and uh, you've been speaking a couple of times, uh, Michael, already today. Um, but in case uh, the you know guys here in the audience haven't heard from you, um, talk us through, I suppose, really on a, on a bigger scale, what kind of role is technology going to play in the future of transportation? Well, um, so first, uh, hi everyone, and thanks for uh, for coming and attending. It's great to be here in London. It took me an hour and a half to get five miles from here to. Uh, so we need, we need technology to play a big role in transportation. Um, you know, we're, I'll just touch on, on the one area that excites me the most, and, and that is um, uh, AI and, and the replacement of a driver, of the human driver with, with a machine. Um, it, it's, it's one of those things that uh, I think we're lucky to be, all of us, uh, living in the age where this will happen. So we're actually going to see it uh, occur. It's going to be a long transition. but it will be one that will save um, millions and millions of lives a year across the world uh, and improve the, the quality of life for all of us. And, and um, as someone grappling with my own middle age, thinking about where will I be in 20 or 30 years from now, at least I won't have to worry about driving a car to get my groceries. Uh, it will be a robot, friendly robot, uh, picking me up and doing that for me, which, uh, which I think is going to be a big, a big, big change for all of us. I mean, the technology that you know we've seen, we saw Lucas's presentation, I'm sure we've all experienced some form of autonomy in a car. 
Um, it's very much there, or it, it will be very soon. How much um, of an issue do you think regulation and the, the, the sort of legalization and the governing bodies, how much of that could hold us back if the technology is ready, but you know, how will it be rolled out? And will we live in a world where autonomy and driverless cars coexist with cars that are being driven, or is it going to have to be one or the other? So the, the second question is easier to answer, which is it's going to it's going to get commingled. So we will be driving as robots will be driving around us, which will make things really interesting. We, we, we actually take for granted the little cues that we and by the way, it's different from culture to culture, right? You, you drive in Italy, uh, you look differently at the drivers around you and depending on their gestures, you know whether you can go into the intersection or not. All these little things the robots won't be able to to figure out, it's not, it's not in there, but robots will be driving around us slowly and then faster and first in certain areas and then in, in other areas and then just everywhere. And that's gonna happen gradually over the next, it's gonna take like every other transition of this sort, it's gonna take a decade or two to really mature, but it will be exciting as it happens. Uh, regulatory, from a regulatory perspective, it's, um, it's, uh, we need regulators, obviously, to, to play ball. Um, the good news is that technology companies doing this haven't, are not waiting for that, right? So they're not waiting for infrastructure to change, for municipalities to change the way roads are constructed. Nobody's assuming anything. Everybody's basically assuming that we just need to find a computer that is smart enough to replace us as human beings and then drive alongside us. Um, I would say that in the U.S., it's been surprisingly uh, constructive and liberal in that regard. That is, the United States, in the, in the U.S., the regulators, and I think it's true for everywhere, um, understand that there's so much uh, political upside as well as just good things from, for humanity involved in having that change occur that they are generally very constructive. And generally, the framework is if the companies doing this can prove to themselves, because they're gonna have to pay for it if they don't, that this is safer than human driving, then the regulators will generally accept that and make it into uh, the regulatory framework. But we're not, we're not there yet. We're a little bit ahead of ourselves on that front. I mean, what startups are doing today is basically playing what we call regulatory arbitrage, which is, if this city is not gonna let me do it, then I'll go to this city. And we're gonna prove safety mm -hmm. in that city and then maybe that old city will catch on. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're basically going to have states and cities shame each other into the right regulatory framework. Uh, and we're gonna prove our safety one jurisdiction at a time. And, and talking about those cities as well, because there's, there's a, a real trend at the moment, you know, cities are becoming smarter, you know, electrification, connectivity. Um, when it comes to autonomy, how can you plan for um, urban smart city? How can a sort of urbanization plan for smarter cities? Yeah, so I made the case that one of the most interesting jobs will be urban planner, right? Because you can literally reimagine every street, every parking lot, every gas station, every traffic light in a city. And so imagine this, the cars drive themselves. What do we do with this real estate? What do we do with um, all of the land that's gonna come back to us? And I think, you know, look, let's hope our best and brightest uh, take a career in urban planning uh, because the, the cities that we reimagine Look, we're either going to get LA or we're going to get Copenhagen, right? Copenhagen has more bikers than car drivers in the city center. LA city planning, basically every question you asked an LA city planner, the answer was more freeways, right? And so hopefully we're going to make a set of really good choices for our cities that result in more livability, fewer accidents, more greenery, more people biking uh, than the other way around. But it's up to us, right? It's not a fait accompli. Let's, let's work it together. Um, and Lucas, clearly with autonomous driving, you know, the way car ownership is going to change, you know, your car is the most expensive asset for the amount of use that we get out of it that we, that we all own. Um, how is, A, how is sort of car ownership change and how do you think that's going to affect, I suppose, the motorsport world and just generally people's passion for, for driving, for the love of cars? Um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, there is a, a statistical data they say that about 90 to 95 percent of the cars in the U.S. Uh, they are at any given time they are parked, either at your house, either at work. So it's a depreciating asset, huge amounts of uh, 
depreciating asset that is not uh, being used as it's supposed to. So car ownership will change. Um, I think especially when it goes towards more autonomy, that also will uh, uh, change. The, the culture of the millennials, this younger generation, the, at least um, I see them taking driving license later or not at all. They're using the apps or using uh, bikes to commute. It's cheaper. Uh, it's better. It's less uh, bureaucratic. That will play also a, a, big, uh, a big change. And this has a direct influence under motorsport. Because if you don't drive, like if you don't ride a horse, like you used to do in the 1800s, you don't appreciate horse racing as much. So if you don't drive, you don't appreciate motor racing that much. And motor racing will go through a crisis. Will go, even if I'm inside that and I, and I understand that the, the market is still big, motor racing will go through a crisis because less people will drive. Um, and that has a big consequence also for the automakers. They start questioning what is their business model. Mm -hmm. If people are not going to be owning cars, is Uber competing against Audi or BMW or Mercedes against Waymo? So Audi intelligence is competing against Google. So there are a range, brand new range of players in this, in this industry that, um, like was just said before, will come to this new uh, mobility for cities for the future. And that will be very interesting and will affect direct my field, which is motorsport. But motorsport is a tiny amount, yeah. is a tiny part. All the rest will also be pretty much uh, affected. Um, that's, it's quite an interesting point you make. You know, it's basically we're merging now auto company, companies with tech companies. Um, Michael, tell us a little bit more about the, the SoftBank's Vision Fund and your recent, I think it was about two and a quarter billion dollars, the investment in General Motors' um, you know, self-driving car unit. Sure, and, and maybe just to um, follow up on the motorsports question, I generally agree. Um, I'm a big fan of motorsports, but um, there's, there's risk to it. I want to take the optimistic view that just as horse racing continues, there's still going to be people strapping themselves behind big engines or in front of big engines and running around like crazy, and a lot of people want to see that. But maybe we'll have robot races. And just we, as we have eSports, for those of you who don't follow, there's, these are basically people playing video. Instead of playing the NBA, they play the eSports League of the NBA. Maybe we'll have the Google robot uh, racing against a VW robot and seeing which one is better, and we're all going to make bets on that. Um, as it relates to uh, to GM and, and our investment in Cruz, um, uh, look, we, we are big shareholders in, in the ride-sharing companies in the world, and we, we are huge believers in what Lucas just said, which is the um, kind of the move towards common ownership of, of cars through ride-sharing networks and the utilization of cars as a result of that and the big changes in the cities uh, that Frank spoke about. So, so we, we, think, we think all that is going to happen, and a big part of the driver to that would be um, the automation of the cars and the replacement ultimately of the driver. The driver is about 60 to 70 percent of the cost of a ride-sharing um, trip. Um, and so, and it's obviously including the fact that the driver occupies a seat that can be monetized. Um, and so if you replace a driver with a machine that is substantially safer, uh, you create a huge economic opportunity both to reduce prices and increase ut utilization of, uh, of these. We, um, we like what we saw with GM's efforts uh, with a company called Cruise, which they acquired and then grew inside of GM and uh, became a partner and investor in, into them. We're still a very large shareholder in, in Uber, and Uber has its own effort, and there's going to be other efforts around that, that are also successful probably, but uh, we hope to see, uh, to see them all succeed, and we hope to see certainly GM and Cruise succeed in bringing this to market safe, safely and, uh, and hopefully quickly so we can all benefit from it. Absolutely. Um, Frank, I'd love to also get your thoughts on which companies sort of outside the traditional auto manufacturers and tech companies that we've touched upon will be affected by this change? Well, I think the biggest opportunity is that, as I pointed out, sort of software and hardware are becoming larger and larger fractions of the price of a car. And so it's going to rewire the supply chain, right? So if Waymo is successful, they become the software provider to many, many of these companies. Waymo doesn't make any money today 
from powering cars, but we expect, we fully expect, and they fully expect, they're certainly spending as if that was gonna be a big part of the ecosystem. So we're very optimistic about sort of hardware and software companies becoming more and more in part, mm -hmm. uh, important parts uh, of the value chain. And then if you think about sort of the next set of investments, obviously getting the cars to drive safely is one thing, but there's a whole service economy that needs to sort of arise around that. So what happens when the car that's driving you around gets a flat? or who cleans the Coke can out of the back of the bottle. Today, the Uber driver does that. Tomorrow, look, the self-driving algorithms don't know how to pick up a Coke can. So we're gonna need to sort of figure all of that stuff out. And so the economies that will sort of grow up around this are gonna create brand new companies that we haven't even contemplated today. And that's exciting, because that's what investors uh, mm. sort of get to invest in. Yeah, I mean, the other thing, we've, we've sort of touched upon um, smart cities, and I think that um, is talked about quite a lot when it comes to autonomous driving. But what about rural areas? Um, you know, Kirsty, I'd love you to sort of explain to us, because you work a little bit with, within rural areas and the autonomous sector, and, and will that catch up, or maybe that could, you know, lead the way? I think that's actually a really great question. And um, we talked a lot about cities earlier, and I'm 100% brought into that reality. You know, I've lived in London for a long time and encountered the nightmares of um, congestion in London. So the idea of fully autonomous shared cities is like a nirvana. But at the same time, I think rural autonomy is really important as well. And actually, there is a potential risk that that gets left behind unless we start looking at it, because the immediate commercial case may not look as appealing as shared driving in cities. But actually, from a societal benefit impact, I think that's really, really valuable. So, you know, wine forage in about 20 years' time, still 30% of the population globally will live in, live in rural areas. It's a little known stat, but actually rural roads are twice as dangerous as urban and highway roads. Hmm. So there really is, I mean, a huge amount of risk associated with rural road driving. And that means there's a huge opportunity to actually get rid of all of those accidents, which is kind of the thing that motivates me and sort of why I'm here today. And I think the other thought I just struck into there is around the older generation. So you talked about how you're hoping in like 30 years time, well, actually, I, I guess your age, I have no idea. Um, in many years time, when you're, you know, that you won't have to drive yourself. And I think that's, you know, a big promise for everybody. And, you know, elderly mobility is a challenge in lots of different countries around the world. Um, but actually, most elderly people live in rural environments. So again, if they get left behind, if we don't think about rural autonomy as well as city autonomy, I think we're really losing a lot of the opportunities that overall um, self-driving cars can promise mm -hmm. and actually it's not that much that's not it's not that much more difficult there are specific challenges associated with the rural roads but they're certainly not insurmountable and we're pretty much pretty excited to be working with some some local councils here in the UK trying to make that a reality because I think it is going to be really important for everybody absolutely thank you um I think I want to touch upon uh car design with you because Obviously, at the moment, a car is designed with the, the driver, really, at its focus. It's about the driving dynamics, how it feels, what's it like to drive. But now, cars are going to have to be designed with the rider, with the passenger at its core. Um, what are we going to see? How are cars going to look? What's the focus going to be? And how quickly can the, the car makers kind of catch up with the needs of autonomy? Um. The whole, uh, th there is actually two, two parts to this question. The first one is when you go from combustion engine to electric, which is the first stage that we are going through now. This changes a lot the, the design aspect of the car. As you probably, if you're a little bit into cars, you can see like a Tesla or any electric car has a battery on the floor, the motors are integrated, center of gravity is lower, you have more space. So already a design of an electric car is not taking a combustion car, taking the motor out and putting a battery. You have to rethink the design. But then, this is the stage we are going through now. The next stage is when the cars are fully autonomous and fully safe. You don't need two tons to take you around the city. You can make designs which are much lighter. If the car doesn't crash, how safe it needs to be, how insurance actually will play a part on that. But how the design, how light it needs to be, what's the threshold between if you have a crash, what happens to you, but maybe you don't need so much protection. So, uh, or probably you don't need so much protection as such a, 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 a huge mass to transport a person around the city. So the design of the vehicle will change uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, much more than it has changed from the horseless carriage that I, that I saw in uh, 1886 until now. So um, uh, this is, such a short period of time, you're talking about 10, 15 years. If you look at the cars from now to 15 years ago, they look about the same. 
So it's, it, it, it is a really big revolution on the, on the automotive segment. Um, we, obviously, we were sort of refer, well, we have so far in the session referring to cars. Um, but Frank, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, di the, sort of the different modes of transport that are also going to be affected. Uh, and also, we've sort of talked about the, the, uh, the Y and the X axis so far, but there's also the Z axis. <laughs> The sky. The sky is the All limit. All right. The <laughs> flying cars are coming. Exactly. Right? So I want to get your thoughts on flying cars. <laughs> yeah. So high level, anything that moves from point A to point B, where there's an economic incentive to take the driver or the pilot out, it's going to happen, right? Because ultimately, algorithms will be safer than human pilots or drivers. And so ships, planes, automobiles, like you, you name it, right? The shopping cart will go autonomous so that it can bring stuff to your house, right? So in the limit, Everything will get autonomy, uh, which is great, because then the incremental cost of getting you from place to place or your stuff from place to place will approach zero, right? Like, that's the goal. The, um, on the flying car stuff, you know, some people will argue that the flying cars are easier because there's fewer of them up there, right? And so um, I talked to a lot of people who work on systems like the systems that you work on. And if you could wave a magic wand and take the humans out, I think the algorithms are ready right now. Like we could just like wave a magic wand and say there are no drivers. The algorithms today are just about ready. And so the thing that makes it difficult is you and me. It's our fault that self-driving is not here because we are crazy people. And trying to anticipate what we will do in every situation is sort of the rate limiting step. Um, and so like, look, in the air, there's very little of that. Um, and so. I think the technology will sort of be easier, uh, which is ironic uh, for self-flying. Then the question is economics. Like, in what corridors does it make sense to operate a flying car service? And you know, not all corridors make sense, right? JFK downtown to the uh, downtown Manhattan, that's a corridor, right? Um, here to Heathrow, maybe that's a corridor. Uh, but getting flying cars to go sort of everywhere uh, is probably not going to happen uh, before we get self-driving cars on the road. So, so maybe I just to relate to, I agree with what was said and relate to this and also to the rule point that was made. The way at least we see this is um, these technologies obviously cost billions and billions of dollars, um, involve a lot of risk, and they're going to be best monetized in urban dense areas where there's a lot of revenues per capita. And, and so you'll see the self-driving cars first there. You'll see the self-flying uh, uh, vehicles, if you will, first in those corridors. But they will, that technology will be made available for mass consumption, including ownership, into rural areas over time. So it's very likely that if once we see the technology mature in the cities and monetized in ride-sharing contexts across many, many millions of people, people living in, in rural areas will get the same technology. It'll just take a bit longer, and it will be less efficient because it's just less people there so we're gonna have to buy it or the the ownership model will not be as efficient but it will be there and, and I I'm a hundred percent convinced that in the rural areas in 20 to 30 years there will be very few people actually driving to the grocery shop back and forth um, on the elevate as uber calls it uber elevate that's coming and it's one of the most exciting things uh, that we can look for it will be 60 miles radius in the most dense areas and the most popular routes to Heathrow and back to, you know, Long Island, back in New York City and the Bay Area where I'm now, which I can't wait for. Uh, and again, it will then proliferate to, uh, to less dense areas and, and uh, less exciting routes, if you will. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. I just want to check, how much longer have we got? Yeah. Oh, that's a shame. I thought, I know. Well, the clock's been ticking, but I thought we had till half past but clearly not. Um, so I uh, just want to very, very, very quickly, in one sentence, wrap up. Uh, how is transport going to look 11 years from today? And the reason I say 11 years is because it was 11 years ago that the iPhone came into our world, and I think that changed it. <laughs> uh, so just very, very quickly. Uh, Michael, do you want to kick it off? Mostly electric, very much shared, and without drivers in the most dense areas. Yeah, per perfectly summed up. That's exactly how we uh, view the world, too. And plus, our stuff comes to us near free. I think that's true, and I'd add to that, um, still in one sentence, that uh, I think that will end result in a complete change in the way we live and work as well. So much of our lives are conditioned around the morning commute. You know, f the average American spends 40 minutes every day commuting, stuck in traffic. Everyone hates doing that, worst part of everyone's day. Imagine the glorious 
change in your life if you never have to be stuck in a traffic jam in the morning on the way to work? A dream. <laughs> and Lucas, finally. Um, I think uh, micromobility will play a bigger role in cities. Electric bikes and scooters and all of this uh, micro segment. Plus, on top of what was said, but I think also third world countries uh, will face a political backlash to keep older technologies as it happened before. Mm -hmm. So this will happen in first world countries, but uh, big populations like uh, India, Brazil, so on, they will be pushed back. We're not going to see autonomous cars in the next 11 years. Brilliant. Well, guys, very insightful. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, a few of our uh, panelists are going to be heading to their speaker's corner, which I think is downstairs, but there's someone going to be at the back with a little lollipop so you can follow them if you have any questions uh, for our panelists. Uh, huge round of applause. Thank you so much, guys.